Hey, you guys, before you get into this episode, when I started filming towards the end of this episode, something happened that has not happened to me yet on this journey. I had to actually stop reading from the chapter. The chapter we're covering today is full of a lot of incredibly wrong information. And as I say in the episode, there's a huge difference between having a different opinion over a story or a different perspective over a story and giving completely wrong information. And so I apologize. I, I encourage you to watch the episode. I did have to pull it early. Um, and I am hoping that the person who wrote this book will reach out to me because up until this chapter, everything has been very amazing in this book. It was just this one chapter where I had to cut it because it wasn't true. But hopefully what I did film of this chapter will be good, good enough for this week. And I would love to hear your, opinion, your, your opinions and your thoughts down in the comment section below. Hello, everybody. Welcome to part 11 of Return of the Divine Sophia. As I said last week, or I think I said last week, I'm pretty sure I said last week. I don't have a ghost here, guys. <laughs> it's my little boy. He's being very needy right now. But anyway, as I said last week, with this Sophia work, this particular book on Sophia, you don't necessarily need to be keeping in order with the different parts, the way that she's organized this information. So if this is your first time here on the channel for this topic, first of all, welcome. Um, second of all, because this is part 11, you don't necessarily have to listen to part one through 10 uh, before part 11. Uh, you can listen to it independently. But if you're interested in part one through 10 before or after proceeding with this recording, I will place the playlist uh, Understanding the Magdalene down in the description box below so you can listen to part one through 10 if you would like. So with part 11, we're looking at chapter 14 which is the many faces of Mary, the eternal one. This part starts in my book on page 272. Only when we begin to understand how vast the mother is, will we begin to understand how powerful she is and how powerful we, her divine children, can be when surrendered to her, guided by her, infused with her immense, passionate, and transfiguring sacred force, and bearing an Andrew Harvey, the divine feminine. The circle gathered on the upper terrace of the grove near the herb garden on Beltane the first day of May. Today, Shasta announced, as the butterflies flittered around us, we will be learning about the many faces of Mary, the Eternal One. I felt a fondness come over me for this in interesting electric group of women sitting on the grass. Most of them wore long skirts, sun hats, and shawls, and I imagined for a moment that circles like this had been called together over the countless ages in flower gardens and at campfires around the world. I wore a short sleeve shirt, leggings, and sandals, but had on a blue cotton shawl to keep me warm in the nippy springtime air. Nippy springtime air in the South? Usually the first day of May in the South is like a burning inferno of hell. And if you're new to this, guys, the woman who wrote this book is from Atlanta. She still lives in Atlanta. And this garden was shot to her teacher. I know I know where it is now. Cindy, my friend from Sacred Garden, who's here on the channel a lot, she's been there. So I'm hoping to be able to go there. And you can tell this is, I'm laughing because we wear shawls in India because we have to because of the culture. But like, the way she's describing how people are dressed, it sounds like the 80s, which we know that this book, this this probably happened to her around the 80s. So I don't know. I just kind of got a little bit of cracked up at uh, the way she said these women were dressed. Because first of all, again, the beginning of May here in Atlanta, Georgia is like an effing bowl of hot soup. It is so effing hot. You don't need a shawl. And you don't really see sun hats that much anymore. So anyway, I digress. After we finished our opening invocation, Shasta announced today is the first day of May, a month dedicated to the maiden and the earth's mother. Its color is green to symbolize nature, and it is the time when the ancient world of the rites of spring. Most communities plant wreaths of flower and erect maypoles to celebrate these rites of mating. Maypoles symbolize the balance between the male and feminine and the tree of life. It's so fascinating because just recently when I was heading down to Florida, I was listening to an old uh, Jordan Maxwell 
um, lecture. And for those who don't know, Jordan Maxwell was probably one of the original researchers when it comes to understanding the Great Awakening. And he actually talked about the tree of life being the magic mushroom, the psychedelic mushroom, which I promote big time. I'm a huge promoter of microdosing. So I thought that was really, really interesting. I never thought about that way. We know that according to like the missing books of the Bible, that the Garden of Eden was a jail sale, that it was Lucifer that held um, even Adam within the garden and through their own understanding, their own awakening, were they able to leave the bondage of the garden of Eden? So that's interesting. Didn't the maypole also symbolize the phallus emerald interjected? Several of us laughed, leaving it to emerald to know the sexual details of the holiday symbols. Shasta nodded smiling. Some would say, but since the use and the maidens use pink and blue ribbons to dance around the trees, mimicking the strands of our DNA, it really symbolized the action of the two parts of ourselves needed to link with the creator. In fact, the Canaanite god Asherah was worshipped as a tree, not only at the winter solstice, but on May Eve as well. Gifts to the poor were left in the tree in her honor. May Day honors both genders who produce the gift of new life together. Several of us nodded. Spring was obviously the time of birds and the bees, the flowers and the trees, and lovers all over the world. I thought that dancing around the maypole was a lovely custom. Isn't that funny? We know that within the awakening, there's also infiltrators, right? So we know a lot of the infiltrators in this awakening keep telling us that the obelisk is Osiris's wiener. When it's not, if you just do a little bit of research, it's not. It's an antenna for electricity. It represents the human spine because the macro and the micro mirror each other. And we hear, have the same thing here. Like, isn't the May pole phallic -y? And she's like, no, it's the DNA of the two sides of the masculine and the feminine coming together. Shasta went on, during this May Day celebration, the oaths of fidelity were taken in marriage. We're given a brief holiday, for this was one of the two festivals where you could sleep with a man or a woman other than your spouse without negative repercussions. Just going to put it out there. I don't do open relationships, so um, I laugh at that because, oh, there would be repercussions. If you're with me and you sleep with someone else, there would be repercussions as in I would no longer be in the relationship. So as a consequence, most wedding took place June, named after Juno, the married queen of heaven. That's interesting. I didn't know that. That is true. Most weddings do take place in June, named after Juno, the married queen of heaven. <laughs> and being from the South, there's no way in hell I'm going to get married in June. I've always known that June was a big month for weddings. I've been to a lot of weddings in June and it's been torturous there is no way in hell i'm putting on a big fucking wet heavy wet white wedding dress in june in georgia no i would rather get married in the fall where it's a little bit less humid donna and susan glanced at each other remembering their own weddings in june the queen of the may was always an aspect of flora the roman goddess of flowers but once the church, church got involved may one was converted to the virgin mary's birth when they later shifted her birthday to september 8th a month sacred to isis the church reassigned may one to the annunciation the announcement of the young maiden mary that she was pregnant but now before anybody says anything it's written may 1 the date and that is actually the correct way to write the beginning of each month and so i've had this conversation before uh, my high school if uh, if we we had to do these like weekly essays in high school and if we got anything grammatically incorrect or if our spelling was incorrect we got an immediate zero on the paper and so i learned grammar and i learned well, I learned how to spell check. But it is May 1, guys. It's not May 1st. May 1st or June 1st, July 1st, August 1st, September 1st, October 1st. You cannot say that. That is grammatically incorrect. And when I hear people say that, when I hear people say, oh, December 1st, it is like nails on a chalkboard for me. I learned that lesson real fast in high school. That is grammatically incorrect. And so they have it grammatically correct here. It's May 1. 
or June 1, July 1. You can say the 1st of May, the 1st of June, but you cannot say May 1st or June 1st. It's grammatically incorrect in English. So before anybody says anything, it's written that way, and May 1 is the grammatical correct way to say it. Trust me, in high school, we would have gotten a zero if we put May 1st because that was grammatically incorrect. Emerald shook her head in disgust. They just couldn't stand for men and women to have sex without guilt, could they? Several of us laughed, seeing the irony that May, the month of fertility, had now been assigned to a virgin. Shasta went on, but in many cultures around the world, the month of May is sacred to the Great Mother. To the Gnostics, it was dedicated to Mary Sophia, and the East to Maya, the mother of the Buddha. And in Greece, it was the month of Maya, Maya, the mother of Her Hermes, the Greek god of wisdom, which is also Thoth. Remember, Thoth was Hermes. It is also the month dedicated to Maj, the May maiden in Scandinavia, to Magna D, the grandmother of time from Syria, and to Almea, the mother of the maiden goddess of eternity from the Middle East. In fact, the name Alma Mama, Alma Mater, which means soul mother, was the name of the Roman teaching priestess who was especially empowered to give instructions in the sexual mysteries. The same term Alma is used in the Hebrew version of the Gospels to describe the Virgin Mary. All the aspects of Mary are parts of Maya Shakti, the world producing mother. And we know that Shakti is the Shiva Shakti. The Shakti is always the expression of the soul. Shiva always takes the masculine. Shakti also to always takes the feminine. So yes, Maya Shakti, the all protecting mother. Wow, there were so many incarnations of Mary. As you can see, Shasta continue, there have been many expressions of the great mother Mary. And today you will be meeting some of them. But before we begin, who can tell me anything interesting about Mary? Any facts? Any ideas about her? I thought back to what I knew from my many years at church. I could think of nothing. Not a zip. Zero. The Protestant church largely ignores her except at Christmas, but Catholics had honored her as the mother of God. Only later was I to learn the Roman church had not granted Mary a halo until the 16th century, while all the male apostles and the magi had been given halos almost immediately because they were men. Alex raised her hand. Mary was the mother of Jesus, she offered. Alma Mari was the mother of Yahshua. Mary wasn't her name. We've covered this so many times on this channel. Mary was a derogatory name. Her name was Alma Mari. And Magdalene was not Mary Magdalene. She was just Magdalene. Claudia and Susan both burst out laughing. Yes, this much was obvious. We'd all been raised Judeo-Christian faiths, and she has been making appearances around the world even today. Right, Shasta nodded. This much we know, but let's go deeper. I found myself reflecting on the, all the appearances that Mary had been making all over the world for the past 200 years, especially since the events of Fatima in 1917. That was when three young Portuguese children, Luca dos Santos and her cousins, Juancita and uh, Franqui, Francesco Marto, had seen a brilliant lady appear over their grazing fields on May 13th of that year. This lady had continued to appear for the next six months, always on the 13th of the month. She had made a series of predictions about world events that were to unfold over the next 80 years. And I knew that some of those prophecies had been made public, warning that if peace did not ensue, there would be a second world war. But the Vatican had concealed parts of the lady's prophecy. The Lady of Light had asked that the church be set up in her honor, dedicated to the Immaculate Heart. During the miracle at Fatima, over 70,000 people have witnessed a strange, whirling globe of light as brilliant as the sun itself. It had moved from east to west, and some claimed that it had appeared to dance the sky, acting in contradiction to all the known tenets of astronomy. These amazing events, and others like them, had captured my attention for years. Since then, I had read scattered reports about Mary's appearance throughout the Middle Ages. These visions often took these visions often took the form of a petite young woman of shining radiance who wore a white dress and a bright blue sash. Sometimes she appeared with a radiant sun behind her, and sometimes light streamed out of her hands. 
In other incarnations, she wore a white cloak and a blue dress with stars on it, images similar to those of the legendary Isis. Certain images pictured the lady with golden flowers at her feet. At times, she floated on a cloud or appeared at the top of the tree or in the mouth of a cave, all symbols associated with the ancient goddess. Interest is, interestingly enough, the lady never identified herself as Mary, but called herself the Lady of the Immaculate Heart, the Virgin of the Poor, the Lady of Goodwill, or the Immaculate Virgin. On occasion, the lady even produced healing springs like the one at Lourdes, and miracles of healing had been reported by those who had immersed themselves in these waters. In recent times, the French Benedictine monk Bernard Billet had calculated between 1928 and 1975 there had been some 332 appearances of the Divine Mother in about 32 countries, although the church had only sanctioned 15 of these. Most of these sightings had occurred on a full or new moon. moon. Later, I was to learn that an astro astrological analysis of these apparitions and the people who had had them revealed a predominance of planets in the signs of Cancer and Virgo, the astrological equivalent of the Mother and the Virgin. Cancer has long been associated with the goddess Ashira and the sign of Virgo with Isis, the original harvest maiden and virgin mother. Many of these astrological charts also had planets in the sign of Capricorn and Pisces, signs opposite Cancer and Virgo. Capricorn is the sign associated with Christmas and the birth of Horus, Osiris, and Jesus on December 25th, although we know Yahshua was actually born on September 11th. It archetypally represents the Divine Father or Son. Pisces the fish is equated with the Ichthys or Vesica Pisces symbol used by early Christians. Together, these four signs, Virgo, Pisces, and Cancer, Capricorn, represent the Virgin and Son and the Mother and Father, respectively. The appearance of such a divine presence in these particular astrological windows cannot be accidental. They reveal a holographic intelligence at work that seems to express the same divine tetrad of male and female energies we spoke of earlier. Donna cleared her throat, interrupting my thoughts. I once read this gospel that claimed that Mary's parents gave her to the Jewish temple to be raised as a virgin priestess when she was only three years old. They claimed that she was so pure that angels fed her. Hmm. This was from the... Protevangeline, a lost gospel that had only appeared around 200 CE. The writers claim that it had been written by the Apostle James some 200 years after Mary's life, which was clearly impossible, impossible since the Apostle James would have been dead by them. <laughs> so it was hard to know if the protoevangeline had simply been fabricated. And we know it was because um, they weren't Jewish. I think that's going to be one of the most shocking things for Christians to learn is that Mary or Al-Mamari Yosef or Joseph and Yahshua were not Jewish. They were Egyptian. I can see the Christians now now cursing me to hell for saying literal facts, but sorry, they, they just weren't. I returned to my thoughts on Mary's miracles. I knew that this Lady of Light had appeared near mosque, church, and synagogues, but often she had appeared in the country, hovering over hovering over a hawthorn, willow, and oak tree, linking her to the tree of life. She had been seen in open fields, at the mouth of caves, and beside rivers, all images linked to the perennial mother. One of the oddest things about these visions was that the lady seemed to take on the appearance of the people she appeared to. In Korea, she looked Korean. In Italy, she appeared Italian. To the indigenous people of America, she, to the indigenous people of America, she seemed to be native. And to the Africans, she was black. She also spoke the languages and dialects of the people of that region. Despite all of this, the church largely tried to ignore her or to minimize her importance in the world. Years later, I read a book called Meeting with Mary, Visions of the Blessed Mother. In the foreword, the chair of the Pontifical Gregorian University writes, The Blessed Virgin, of course, has nothing divine about her. She is not God. Mary is just a human being. 
She was the statue of a creature. However, she is the mother of Jesus Christ, who does have divine as well as human status. Thus, she is the mother of God. She has no power of her own, but she is and always will be the mother of the most powerful person who ever walked the earth. I understood then what Shasta meant. The patriarchal powers would do all they could to marginalize the divine feminine and by association the value of all women everywhere. Sarah raised her hand. I read somewhere that Mary's mother was a, a Celtic princess named Anna who came to the Holy Land to marry in a scene. Now we were getting somewhere. Well, Anna was his grandmother, I believe. Yes, Shasta said. The mother Mary was both Celtic and Hebrew ancestry, and her, her name was actually Mary Anna, named for her mother. No, that was not her name. There is some stuff in here that is just incorrect compared to research we have now. But of course, again, I think a lot of this information was collected in like the 80s and 90s. Her name was Alma Mari. Anna was her mother, her grandmother. And she might have been Celtic looking as Magdalene was also Celtic as Magdalene's mother, who was also named Magdalene, was Kentuckian. But um, they were really considered Egyptian. There was no Hebrew ancestry in any of them. They had Hebrew students. They had Jewish students. But they, they themselves were Egyptian. Sharon spoke up. Isn't Mary, Mary associated with roses and holy springs? Shasta nodded. Yes, the lady is often said to appear over rose bushes and hawthorn trees, a tree that blooms in May. In fact, hawthorn flowers are used to celebrate marriages in spring. In some parts of Europe, a man would propose to a maiden by leaving a branch of hawthorn flowers at his beloved's door. In Greece, the blossoms were woven into crowns for wedding couples and carried as torches in the wedding procession. Probably why we still carry bouquets of flowers today in weddings. Emerald jumped in. Yeah, Hawthorne is called Whitehorn, Quickset, or the fairy bush that was used by the Cardinia, the virgin goddess in Rome, for her festivals in May. Emerald was really on the ball. She knew a lot about these fascinating details. Shasta went on. In parishes around the world, May is still celebrated as Mary's month, and her statues are crowned with wreaths of fresh flower, reminiscent of the festivals to Flora. They sing, O oh Mary, we crown thee with flowers today, Queen of the Angels, Queen of May. We looked at Shasta in astonishment. She stood up, indicating that we should all rise. Shall we try it? We came to our feet. Soon we were skipping around the garden in laughter. O oh Mary, we crown thee with flowers today, Queen of the Angels, Queen of May. After a few minutes, we collapsed in delight, sprawling on the ground. That was fun, I said, putting a flower in my hair. Shasta spoke from her place in the grasses. The rose is the symbol of the awakened heart. Ariel had long ago told me that she loved pink roses, and sometimes the room was suffused with their scent when I was in communion with her. Mary is also connected with caves, healing waters, and the moon. The moon, like the chalice, is a symbol of the changing lunar aspects of the goddess. Like the cave, it represents the womb of the Great Mother. In the ancient mysteries, caves were some of the holiest sites of initiation. In a cave, it was way easier to move in resonance with Mother Earth. That is why Native Americans create sweat lodges today, so that they can listen to the heartbeat of the Mother. I couldn't help think of all the saints and sages who had lived in caves, including John the Baptist and the Apostle John the beloved who wrote Revelation. Claudia cleared her throat. Hey, I could be way off here, but I read somewhere that Mary was an initiate to the Egyptian mysteries. Is that true? A smile spread slowly across Shasta's face. Yes, Mary Anna and Mary Magdalene both studied in Egypt. When the Holy Family fled to Egypt, Mary and Joseph spent time in the mystery schools of the Melchizedek order in the temples of Egypt. The Melchizedeks the Melchizedek were the spiritual teachers sent to assist the angels, just as the mystery schools were created to help humans. This order acted as the invisible college that aided all other mystery schools in Egypt, Greece, and Galilee, and the Druids. The Melchizedek order exists beyond the mortal world to help the planetary alignment. When the Holy Family entered Galilee, Mary's work continued among the Essenes, where she eventually led to the inner circle of, initi of initiates that supported the mission of Yahshua. That, all of that is not true. Sorry. Trisha, that is not true. At all. 
we have more information now. They didn't flee to Egypt. They were from Egypt. And they were sworn into the priest and priesthood of Isis. The Essenes were not Jewish. The Essenes, E-S-S-E, that's how Isis's name was spelt. They were the priest and priesthood of Isis. The Sadducees, the Pharisees were two Jewish sects. But the Essenes were Egyptian. All right, coming from Atlantis. So Mary Anna was a priestess of Isis, Claudia persisted. And again, her name was not Mary Anna. Anna was her mother's name. She was Alma Mari. Yes, but it was Magdalene who underwent the full training as the priestess of Isis in Egypt. That is true. Yes, Magdalene did go through the full training. We saw that in the Magdalene manuscript. This is the real we reason why we call her Mary the Magdala or the Mary the Great. The word Magdala means the strength of holding people together in safety. So one of her titles was the stronghold or tower, the guardian or protector of the people. Mary, Magd Mary Magdalene contained the enlightened energies of Sophia, the female Christ. And she did not come from Magdala, by the way. No, she did not come from Magdala. But it actually, it's like when I see her people calling her Mary, it like makes me sick to my stomach because she has been very clear with me. Her name is not Mary. Stop calling her Mary Magdalene. Her name was Magdalene. End of story. Her name was Magdalene. And no, she was not from Magdala. That is true. She was not from Magdala. She was from Egypt. But Magdalene, from what she has told me, has something to do with the female womb. It's the womb. The community of Magdala did not exist in her day, despite what the church would like you to believe. This is just another way of making people stop, stop searching for deeper answers. Magdalene's level of spiritual wisdom was one of the reasons that male disciples were so uncomfortable with her. Most Jewish men were threatened by women with her deep depth of spiritual wisdom. As I said, Magdalene and Yahshua were not Jewish, but a lot of their, their students were. But they themselves were, again, not Jewish. Emerald nodded, no doubt thinking about her law firm. Shasta went on, it's not by, by accident that both of these women were called Mary. This is where, no, this is, well, this is fake news. For the Hebrew Mari or Miriam has long with the title of initiation across the word for female shamans who are often distinguished by their blue robes. No. Nope, 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 and nope. I do hope to get in touch with Trisha one day because most of the stuff I agree with, but there's some stuff that's like, that's fake news. That's propaganda. And they didn't wear blue robes. They wore red robes. A while ago, we were under the impression that it was the order of the blue robe that was Magdalene's order. No, it was the order of the red robes. Why red? Why red? Why does Mr. T wear red ties a lot? Why do I have red on right now? If I don't wear something wear red like this, I wear a red bracelet. Why is that? Because demons can't see red. Demons cannot see red. The order, Magdalene's order did not wear blue robes. They wore red robes. Actually, I have a Magdalene red robe. One second, I'll get it for you and I will show you. This is my Magdalene red robe that I now wear when I go through initiations. Why? Why do I wear the red robe, the Magdalene red robe, when I go through initiations? Well, not only, again, do demons not see red, but I am part of the Magdalene line. I am part of her line. So that's where I wear red. And we see this. We saw this in the Sophia Code. What did they wear in the Sophia Code? What do all the deities wear in the Sophia Code? The women, red robes, not blue robes. The blue robes, the blue robes are all fake news. It's all fake news to, to pull you away from the truth. And Mari or Miriam or Mary was not, absolutely was not a form of saying this woman is a shaman. No, it's a Jane Doe name. It was meant to take away their actual identity. Mary Ma or Magdalene herself has been very insistent with me that she be called Magdalene. 
Actually, with me, in private, I call her Maggie because that's what her dad called her. And that's what she likes to be called by people who are close to her is Maggie. But Magdalene was her name. Magdalene. That's it. No Mary, just Magdalene. All right. I had long suspected that Mary was some sort of a title. It's not. It's derogatory. Especially since there were so many of the women in the Bible with that name. <laughs> there are so many women in the Bible with the name Mary because it's derogatory. It's, der it's derogatory. Why would the women that were seen as less than have a special significant name to make them a priestess or a shaman and the men not have a special name? Common sense. It's not... It's not a title of a shaman, of a female shaman. It's derogatory. We have to stop this. Stop calling them Mary. Stop it. That's so disrespectful. It is so disrespectful. Yahshua's mother's name was Alma Mari. Yeah, I'll say this again. His name was not Jesus. It was Yahshua. And his mother's name was Alma Mari. His wife, her name was Magdalene. And they wore red robes, not blue. Demons cannot see red. What was their galactic lineage? Lyran, the lion. What do Lyrans do? What's the main purpose of the Lyrans? That it's also one of the fundamental purposes of the priest and priesthood of Isis. They hunt demons. So the red is the camouflage they wear. Again, that's hence why I always have something red. When I'm on camera, I always have something red on. Whether it's a shirt or a bracelet or something. Or my nails are red. Something. Because I know that now. I've studied that now. I was told by one of my superiors in spirituality, this is why Mr. T always wears a red tie. Demons can't see red. Okay. Okay. And didn't Mary and Mary Magdalene usually appear dressed in blue as a female priestess? No, no, you guys, no. If the church is telling you something, it's not true. Whatever the church tells you is a bold face fucking lie. There is no organization in this world that lies more than the church. No, this is actually making me mad. I really wish I could talk to this lady because her information is so wrong here. It's so often it's. I know she doesn't mean disrespect by it because I really like her work. I like what she's written so far. But everything she's got in this section is so disrespectful. It's so unbelievably disrespectful. There were three who walked with Christ. Mary, his mother, her sister, also Mary, and Magdalene. The three were Mary. Why would two daughters be named Mary? Like, common sense here, Trisha. Common sense. Come on, Trisha. Common sense. Why would why would you name two of your kids the same name? You wouldn't, would you? So his mother's Mary and his aunt's also Mary? Girl, come on. Come on. Let's think about this. All right. The passage referred to Mary the mother, Magdalene, and Mary Salome. Jesus's aunt, perhaps all of them and priestesses. No, they were just highly disrespected. Shasta continues, Somatic people called her Miriam, the mother goddess, and the Pyrene, she was Mari, the eternal spirit of the land. In Syria, she was Aphrodite Mari, and in Asia, she was Maya, the maker of the world. In Celtic tradition, she encompassed all three fates who spin the past, present, and future, and the three my my. My Hophorus, the women who anoint the deceased in Hebrew tradition. Something that Magdalene went to the tomb to do for Yahshua. Well, let's talk about anointing. Thank you to Jordan Maxwell. I learned this from him. To anoint someone means to mark them for sacrifice. To baptize someone is an anointing for sacrifice. When I learned that, when my parents baptized me when I was like three months old, they dressed me in white, they took me to the church, and they had me anointed. What do sacrifices wear? They wear white. So literally, 
when you're baptizing your kid and you're putting them in white and offering them to the church, you're offering them as a sacrifice. Because what does church mean? It comes from the word Kirk, which comes from the Greek god Circe, who was the goddess who hypnotized people, hypnotized them, and fed off of them. Stop baptizing your kids. And also, Yahshua wasn't crucified, so that was Mithra. That was Mithra. So Magdalene wasn't in no tomb doing anything to her husband. That was Mithra, not Yahshua. All of these aspects of the Great Mother who oversees the cycles of life, death, and rebirth. But these names, Mari, Mata, and Martaria are simply the title of Isis Sophia. Nope, not true. Not true. The great queen of heaven. She was honored by the early Christians until the council of Nicaea replaced her with the only masculine version of God. But Gnostics teach that the spirit of Christ cannot be realized until the feminine face of God is once more honored across the word world. Then men and women will stand together as equals. This was certainly intriguing. Gnostics did did honor a female version of God. I mean, we see that in the Missy Gospels where Yahshua calls God father, mother, or mother, father. Gnostic wisdom says that Magdalene has continued to reincarnate for the last 2,000 years on earth in different forms. They believe that her return as the female Christ will spark a wave of world awakening. So this is obviously going to be a very hard chapter for me to get through because none of this is accurate. Oi, Trisha. Oh, Trisha, this isn't correct. It's not correct. Magdalene was the female Christ, but she was the female Christ with her husband, Yahshua. The original Jewish prophecies, prophecy said there would be two of them. Even though they were Egyptian, they still met the prophecy. Two of them. She was the Christ in her life as Magdalene, and she has not come back since she was Magdalene. She's coming back soon. When we go into 4D, but she's not coming back. She doesn't need to be here right now. This isn't her karma. The shit we're going through and their density is not her karma or Yahshua's karma. Neither one of them are back right now. No, Kennedy is not Yahshua. They're not back right now. They don't need to be back. To think that somebody else is going to save you is cabal programming. It's negative polarity. You can only save yourself. The karma we're living through right now is ours. It's not theirs. They will come back when we flip. They believe that her return as the female Christ will spark a wave of world awakening. No, they knew that she was the Christ then. Trisha, if by chance you're listening to this, can you please contact me? Because this chapter is, in my opinion, you need to remove this chapter from the book because it's full of just fake news. And this is a great awakening. And most of the stuff you have in here is fantastic. But this chapter is not good. Not good. Because it's not true. It's fake news. It's propaganda. This reinstatement of the divine feminine is central to the second coming. And one of the reasons why the goddess is so important to this world today. There is no second coming, guys. There is no second coming. That was... There was a prophecy. A Jewish prophecy that said that two people were going to come to help us flip timelines, basically. Didn't say they were coming back. Now, I know that Yahshua and Magdalene are coming back, but they're not coming mm. back for you. They're coming back for them. They probably won't even live public lives. Stop thinking somebody else is going to save you. If you keep thinking somebody else is going to save you, you're going to go negative. I can't think of something more narcissistic and psychopathic than thinking somebody else is going to do it for you. Let's wake up. Wake up. Okay. Wow, my mind was reeling. I never heard anything about this before because it's not true. This is bullshit. As strange as it might sound, 
it somehow made perfect sense. But it's bullshit, Trisha. This isn't true. The information is out there, girl. This is all bullshit. Our world has fallen out of balance. And to find your way back, we must learn to honor both male and female. That I agree with. But it's not, that's not Magdalene's job. It's your job. The logic and the intuitive are thinking and feeling natures to be made. Malachi writes, the true nature of the second coming is something more than the incarnation of the Christos and women. It's the dawn of the Christ consciousness and a sufficient number of individuals to affect a radical transformation in the collective human consciousness. Yes, that I can agree with. It's the rebalancing of the feminine with the masculine, but it's not coming from one person. We are all the Christ. We all have the Kundalini within us to arise. And as I said before, the society that we have not been living in has not, it has not been a patriarchal society. It has been a Luciferian one. Because if you take away the divine feminine, you lose the divine masculine. If you take away the divine masculine, you lose the divine feminine. We've been living under Luciferian. And so we're re-emerging the balances between the two to get rid of the Luciferian. Well, we would certainly need a transformation to grad a well, we would certainly need a transformation to gra graduate from our endlessly competitive way of life. It was only years later that I discovered some of the incredible writings that Shasta was referring to. In the Hidden Gospels of Magdalene, we read, The soul of Yahshua Messiah ascended into repose in the living Father, but it said that the soul of Kala Messiah remains in the world with us. As yet, not having been accepted and received in full, she continues to incarnate, incarnate in woman's form. No, this isn't from Magdalene's Gospel. I, I know Magdalene's Gospel by heart. This is not from y'all. I'm even wondering if I should finish this chapter. I mean, I, I like to read everything because we need to see everything. But this is just so not right at all. I'm going to finish, but I I don't want you guys to be confused. Do your own research because none of this stuff she's written is coming from where she's saying it's good. Because this is not in Magdalene's Gospel, what she's reading right here. This is not coming from Magdalene's. I know Magdalene's Gospel by heart at this point. I've covered it multiple times on this channel, page by page. This is not in Magdalene's Gospel. Yeah, no, this is not... First of all, Magdalene's Gospel is the story of Magdalene talking about how to work through the Kalashas or the egos, not about a second coming. So, anyway, I'm actually going to just skip down to the Lady of, of Guadalupe because this is actually really pissing me off because it's not, it's just bullshit. So, anyway, this is the first time any of the material we've read. There's been material we've read on this playlist that um, I haven't agreed with. But this is the first time I've actually gotten physically sick to my stomach and like pissed off because it's so, it's just, you know, it's one thing to have a different opinion on something or a different perspective on something, but it's another thing to have just completely incorrect information. And that's what this is. This section has been completely incorrect information. And like I said, I don't know if it's because this was written at a time with some of this information that I now have, that a lot of researchers now have, was not available. And maybe it just hasn't been corrected since then. Or if it's just infiltrated, I don't know. It, it feels like, this section feels like infiltration to me. And I'm not saying that Trisha, the writer of this book, intentionally put infiltration information into this, but that's what it sounds like. So I'm just going to go ahead and go down to the Lady of Guadalupe. After a few minutes, we moved to a st second statue several yards away. This lady was dressed in a long red gown and a sky blue cloak with golden stars. A corona of light surrounded her. This is the Lady of Guadalupe who appeared in Mexico nearly 500 years ago, Shasta said. I thought she looked like the large stone statue that I had bought years earlier to put in my own backyard. I love the sweet expression on her face. Shasta indicated that she should. we should all sit down, so we took our places quietly on the surrounding benches. I am now going to tell you the story, a story of the Lady of Guadalupe. She began looking down at our upturned faces. 
The year was 1531, and the Aztec natives of Mexico were in their 10th year of slavery under the tyranny of the Spanish conquistadors. The children of the sun had seen their temples profaned, their gods transformed into demons, and their culture stripped of gold. Millions have been murdered, and others forcibly converted to Christianity all in the name of Yahshua. As a result, the people went about their lives as quietly as possible, afraid that they would be killed. I was listening to Billy Carson the other day, and he was talking about the origins of religion. And he said, like, Christians think that Christianity spread so quickly across the world because it was the good news, it was the gospel, but that's not true. Christianity spread all over the world because they would kill you if you didn't accept it. It's just, Christianity is literally the most violent religion in the world. There is more blood on the hands of Christianity than there is in Satanism. That is why Christians are violent. Like, if, I've said this before, like, the only people who send me death threats, you know, besides the coven that's after me, but now I know those are just bots paid for by the coven, so LOL, um, are Christians. Hindus don't send me threats. Buddhists don't send me threats. Muslims don't send me threats. Jewish people don't send me threats. Christians do. It's a violent religion. Very violent religion. On December 9th, 1531, however, a middle-aged widower set off from his village to go to a larger church in Santiago. His Christian name was Juan Diego, but in his native tongue, his name meant he who, who speaks like an eagle. On the way, the man passed a hill in the outskirts of town that was once the site of the temple of the Aztec mother goddess. Suddenly, Juan Diego heard the songs of the many singing birds. Curious, he climbed the hill and found it covered by a brilliant rainbow of cloud of mist. Then a lady called his name. When the mist cleared, the man saw a beautiful lady standing in front of a blazing sun dressed in the blue and red robes of Aztec royalty. The lady asked uh, Juan Diego where he was going. He said that he was going to celebrate the feast day of God's mother at the local church. Only later did he realize that the lady had spoken to him in his native tongue. I looked around the circle, and I saw that they, we were all listening with rapt attention. With rapt attention. The lady then told Juan Diego that she was the mother of the creator of heaven and earth, and that she wanted him to build a temple to her on this very hill. That way, all who loved her could call upon her, and she would ease their suffering. The lady instructed Juan Diego to go to the town's bishop and tell him her request, but he thought that no one would believe him. Yet, he agreed to do as he was asked. He arrived at the large church where Bishop Zumarega ruled, a Franciscan priest who had killed thousands in the Spanish Inquisition before coming to America. Yeah. Christian churches are a bunch of serial killers. That's all Christianity is. It's just a bunch of fucking serial killers. I mean, the bishop listened to Solomon and then told Juan Diego that if the, his story was true, he should come back with a sign to the lady. Discouraged, Juan Diego left, finding his way back to the mysterious hill. To his surprise, the lady was still there. He explained what had happened and declared that if he was not able to send and declared that he was not the one to send her message since the bishop had not listened. The lady said, listen, my son, I have many servants and many messengers to whom I can entrust this message. But the humility of your heart pleases me. Am I not your mother? Am I not life and health? Have I not placed you on my lap and made you my responsibility? The lady told Juan Diego to go to the top of the hill where he would find the sign that the bishop had asked for. Then she vanished. Juan Diego climbed to the summit of the hill and found among the blackened ruins of the mother's temple a lavish red rose. Here were where all Castilian roses that were the hallmark of Spanish royalty. Gathering as many as he could in his tunic, he ran back to the bishop's place in excitement. This time they kept him waiting for hours in the courtyard, but eventually the bishop's assistant led him in. Juan Diego opened his tunic and let all the roses spill out on the floor, their crimson petals belaying the cold coldness of the wintry season the assistant cried out and the bishop rose as if struck by lightning but it was not just the incredible roses that were staring at staring at but juan diego's tunic for there was an image of the lady em emblazed on it she appeared as a young aztec woman with dark skin and eyes the golden rays radiating from her body Aztec hieroglyphics were embodied on her clothing and as they examined the image they could see the images of juan diego looking up at her in the pupils of her eyes. Shasta paused, giving us a moment for the story to seek in. 
What a tale. Roses in winter and an image painted on his tunic. Was she kidding? Wow. This was the story of the Lady of Guadalupe. Shasta went on. From the beginning, there were many miracles associated with the Lady's coming. The first was the healing of Juan Diego's uncle, who was visited by the Lady at the exact moment when his nephew was gathering roses. It was his uncle who first told the bishop's secretary that the Lady's name was Guadalupe. Some speculated that since the uncle spoke in Nahuatl, the language of the Aztecs, he might have said Cotalupia, the Aztec goddess who names, names walks on serpents. Regardless, her symbols are the same as both Mary and Isis, gold stars on a blue cloak with a sickle moon and a serpent at her feet. Emerald raised her a hand. The word Guadalupe is not Spanish, you know, but Arabic. It means hidden river or spring that bundles up from a cave. I learned that in college. Leave it to Emerald to know something like that. Shasta nodded. Yes, Guadalupe means spring, just as we find in the story of Isis, Mary, and the Lady of Lourdes. Her robe is the red blood of sacrifice, she who bleeds but does not die. It is one of the three colors, white, red, and black, that represents the maiden mother in crone, colors now used by the church in their priestly robes. No, black is used because they're in the cult of Satan. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> Oy vey. Uh, the lack of research for this is kind of shocking to me at this point because that's pretty easy. And the red is used not because of sacrifice, but because literally demons can't see it. So, oy, oy vey. Like, I can't help but laugh because research is not that hard. Shasta continued. <laughs> The lady's mantle was blue, like the robes that the priestess, like Mary Magdalene and Isis wore across the Mediterranean. Shasta concluded her tale. The lady's mantle was blue, like the <laughs> Even Ravi's upset with this fake news. Their robes were not blue, guys. They were red. We saw that in the Sophia Code as well. We get that, right? Like, this is information coming from the cabal to confuse us. This is infiltrated information. It was also the color of Aztec nobility and the rays of sun where her luminous body of light. They form a doorway from the great central sun, just like the Visica Pisces. The black band around her waist denotes pregnancy in Aztec culture, and the golden symbol embroidered over her womb is the Aztec hierarchy for the heart of the universe. The heart of the universe lies in the womb of her body. What a concept, I marveled. Later, I was to discover that for centuries, art historians have studied Juan Diego's tunic, trying to determine the exact composition of the painting. The nature of the pigments, temper oils, watercolor and fresco cannot be precisely determined nor can anyone explain why the fragile tunic of cactus fibers was never never deteriorated or faded although it has been exposed to fog candlelight smoke and humidity for over 450 years truly a miracle the black madonna next we followed shasta to another part of the garden and this time we stood before a large statue of mary made of ebony at the statue's feet lay red, white, and black candles, and now I understand why. This is the Black Madonna, Shasta explained, the hidden mother, the one others cannot see. Her colors represent the three cycles of birth, life, and death. The Black Madonna is a sage. She is Isis Sophia, Sophus Isis, the name given to the star Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. This is the home of one of the greatest galactic councils. So the Black Madonna is linked to the hidden wisdom that others cannot see. Now, this I find interesting. She is the veiled one, the Kala Sophia, the dark mother, the womb of creation from which the universe is born. She is Magdalene, the female Christ, the part of all women everywhere who are never acknowledged for their gifts. We stood in silence, contemplating the profundity of these, of these teachings. Years later, I was to learn about Kali Ma, the goddess who destroys the ego and rebirths the soul. I know a lot about Kali. She is also the Shakti, the power that run, runs the cosmos, the active, ever-changing aspect of regeneration who bears the world child. Historian Barbara Walker writes, whatever power anything possesses, that is the god goddess. Without her, neither man nor god could act at all. 
She is the hidden wisdom. Her titles are the treasure house of compass of compassion, the giver of life and the life of all that lives. This aspect of the great mother is said to have created the magical letter of the Sanskrit alphabet. No, the Sanskrit alphabet comes from Lord Shiva. Trisha, girl, your information is so long in this chapter. I'm so confused, Trisha. You do such a good job researching, but this is all bullshit. I've actually spent years studying in India through all the Vedic texts. Shiva gave the alphabet, not a female, okay? It was the masculine half. <laughs> Oy vey, I don't know what to do with this chapter, guys. It's just I, it's doing me in. Like, I want to keep reading because it's in for, like, we need to know what the fake stuff is, but it's still, it's just like makes you want to cry because Trisha, oh, Trisha, Trisha, Trisha. Please, if you're watching, contact me. Trisha McCannon, if you're all the chapters leading up to this one i've agreed with you and it's not that i don't agree it's just that it's fucking wrong what you've written here is wrong like i was digging this black madonna stuff until you got to the whole sanskrit oy vey i don't even know what to do trisha it's just so wrong i don't know if you like just took what shasta said as being like fact and you just wrote it without doing research I would hope that at this point we know not to take anything anyone says as fact, even me. Like, I hope that we would just do our own research because I, like, like I want to cry right now because this is just, it's so disrespectful, Trisha. Like, everything that you've written in this chapter, not only is it wrong, but it's a literal slap across the face of the truth. And I don't think you did it intentionally. I really don't. I think you are a very smart person, and I think that you have really good intention Sorry, my dog's itching himself. I don't know if you guys can hear this. But I think that this just got away from you. And I just think, like, I don't know what to do. I don't know if I finished this chapter or not because it's really just not you. I don't want to put fake information out there. Like, I understand reading all perspectives of a subject. But a, pers a perspective of a subject or an opinion of a subject is different from something that is just not true. And this shit's just not true. I just don't know what to do, guys. I mean, here she is talking about the blood of Jesus. And they're talking about the Merovingians here, but even what I'm re reading here isn't true about the Merovingians. I've done deep dives with the Merovingians. What she says here is just not even true. You're, Tr Trisha. Yahshua was not crucified. I would think that someone as, as well versed as you would understand that what they did is they took the teachings of the Christ and they intermarried them with the story of Mithra. The Merovingians were called the Merovingians because she's talking about the next, the Merovingians, because they carried Magdalene's blood, which was the O negative bloodline which was the Atlantean bloodline. It all goes back to Atlantis. And I know, I know, Trisha, like I know that you're still, when you wrote this book, you were still under the, um, the, con the, the, the idea of the timeline as we have it as being true. We know that's not true anymore because of Tartaria. So I, I just, um, y'all, I think I'm just going to cut this chapter. I think I'm going to leave it. And we'll just pick up next chap next week with the lost teachings of Jesus. And I'm sorry, usually I like to end these these chapters really strong, but um, I can't. I can't end this. I'm just. I mean, I really want you guys to get your own book so you can read this chapter for yourself. But I just cannot. I'm being told right now to not go forward with this chapter by my guides right now, because it's, it's not true. Like it's not. Again, it's not that this is just a different perspective of a topic, or a different view of a topic, or a different opinion. It's just not true. And yeah, if you guys know, so I, I'm sorry, guys, we're just going to end it here. Again, we'll pick up next week with chapter 15. I can't believe this is the first time I've ever had to do this in this whole. If you know Trisha McCannon or if Trisha McCannon is watching right now, please reach out to me. Girl. Girl.
please reach out to me. Everything else before this chapter has been fantastic. And again, I don't know if you're just repeating, you're just regurgitating things that Shasta told you. I don't know. I mean, are you researching what she's telling you? Because that is how we get stuck in like a cabal <sighs> is when we just like, I want to cry right now. This information is just not, it's just upsetting because we've come so far in this great awakening. We've come so far. We've had to relearn literally everything, everything. And I understand that for a long time, I mean, 20 years ago, I probably would have believed everything in that chapter, but Sanskrit is what got me. That's what made me want to close this book because girl, you're messing with someone who's actually studied Sanskrit and can speak Sanskrit. Studied it in India for many years. I can give you my professor's name and contact if you want to talk to him. So anyway, all right, guys, I'm just going to end it here. Be good. Do your research. Do your research. This is a lesson. I, I just do your research, guys. We'll pick up next week with chapter 15.